Hello, everybody. So I'm going to start with this neutron scattering theory part one after Jennifer. I'm a second year PLC student. So uh, this is the overview, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's a creation and annihilation operator, neutron matter interactions, and then conservation and momentum and energy, and uh, elastic and inelastic scattering, and bit of quasi elastic scattering, and then uh, summary of, of and then introduction of phone and then summary of all the results, all the slides I have shown. Okay, and uh, after this one hour, I should start with a joke. Uh, a neutron walks into a bar and asks how much for a pint of beer. The bartender looks at the neutron and replies, for you, no charge. Uh, actually, I found, it, I found this in a, uh, in, in a book by Andrew T. Boothry. Okay, so let's get to the real topic. Uh, so first topic is and creation and annihilation operator. They allows us to explore the Fox space, uh, but uh, we should know what the Fox space is. So Fox space, uh, Fox space is a uh, algebraic construction of uh, quantum states uh, of a quantum mechanics uh, that used to construct the quantum state space of a variable number of uh, particles or unknown number of particles. Uh, or you can also say like uh, Fox space provides a platform where we can perform quantum mechanics when the number of the particles isn't fixed. Uh, it, is, uh, it is first explained by Vladimir Fock. Uh, he's a, a Russian physicist. And, uh, but like, why, why do we care about Fox space? Uh, what does it tell us? Uh, uh, like uh, it, it mostly used in two theories such as quantum field theory and quantum statistical mechanics in which we vary the number of particles. In quantum field theory, uh, in quantum field theory, we study the relativistic theory of quantum mechanics where we create and annihilate the number of particles or, or antiparticles. In quantum statistical mechanics, uh, we can, um, where a system can, can be in equilibrium with the with a particle reservoir, uh, there you can, uh, within, uh, I mean, like the part, with a particle reservoir, they exchange the number of particles. And, uh, and these, uh, these particles are described within the grand canonical ensemble. So they are, we, are can, we can also use Fox space to drive this. And for more practical reasons, uh, Fox space is very useful mathematical tool. Uh, like uh, to use it to use it where the number of particles is fixed. Uh, for like during calculation, where we want to, where we may allow, uh, or we want to allow the particles to change, or the number of particles to change or vary. Uh, there we can use the Fox space, but in the end we always uh, recover the fixed number of particles. So uh, Fox space. Uh, uh, it's re it's really essential. Uh, it's very it's very important to to know about the operators who works on the Fox space. Uh, where, uh, where by these operators we may we may change we may change the number of uh, we may change the number of the particles in the in the Fox space or we uh, navigate the number of particles in a Fox space. So uh, these operators are called uh, creation or annihilation operators for obvious reasons as they create or annihilate the number of particles or antiparticles. But first we should uh, know what the annihilation and creation really means. So uh, for electron, uh, this, is a, this is a, you can see here, one second. Uh, you can see here uh, atom with different particles in it and uh, for like electron, like electron, uh, positrons, uh, which which might be the production, which might be the result of beta positive decay, they produce uh, and and you can see they uh, they disappear almost immediately after the production. It is because of uh, the process of annihilation. Uh, if you see here, uh, there is a positron here, and the, and the electron. Uh, uh, as we know that uh, electrons are so electrons are everywhere present in the in, in the atom, so it is very likely for a positron to encounter the electron. 
and uh, create two gamma radiations uh, such as photons, uh, uh, such as photons with a energy similar or more than 0.5 me meg electron volt. So these electrons and positrons cre create two photons, uh, at least two photons. It can create more. And uh, this is the same process can, can be done by proton or antiproton, which is also called annihilation. So uh, like uh, these two photons, uh, when, they, uh, when they produce, they go in the opposite direction. Uh, that's why they, con they conserve the momentum or they follow the principle of conservation of momentum. But um, uh, like uh, the rest energy, like uh, the particles uh, who have the rest energy before the, before the collision, uh, they, they are, after collision, they are, they are for producing the photons uh, with, with, the rest energy, with the radiation energy, because we know that uh, photons do not have a, uh, do not have a, a rest energy and also rest mass. So they will all convert into the radiation energy. And opposite to this process, we have creation where photon comes to the, comes to the nucleus or comes to the atom. Uh, and then it, when it goes through the atom, uh, it will produce uh, two different kind of particles which have a non-zero non -zero rest mass or non-zero uh, rest energy. Uh, so, uh, but like if we want to create an uh, electron positron pair, uh, we might need a photon with more than one mega electron volt energy. So here comes the equation. Uh, if, you, if you can see here, it's a, it's a F, which is a Fox space, uh, which I told you earlier about this. So Fox space is a, a, the this direct sum of the different Fock states uh, uh, of this part of the number of particles like uh, F0 means they are one particle. Uh, there's F0 means there are zero number of particles in the Fock state one. And the, in this there will be one number of one particle and there will be two particles and so on. And uh, we can describe it uh, according to different uh, particles like uh, for bosons, for fermions. Uh, if some of you might not know, uh, bosons are, uh, Bosons are the particles uh, in which uh, they, fo they follow the symmetric, uh, uh, symm symmetric relations and uh, commutation relations. And uh, for example, photons, gluons, or Higgs boson, they are boson particles. And fermions, they follow anti-symmetric relations. Uh, and like electron, proton, neutron, they are fermions. So here we see in this equation, uh, the set of, uh, I mean, we consider a set of uh, basis states uh, ui which have a single particle state space v and in this uh, we have this fox states uh, n1 n2 n3 which means that uh, we have n number of particles n i number of particles in a ui state so when this creator operator associated with the ui states uh, uh, we can denote it as a ui a ui dagger and uh, when it acts on the fox state we get this this equation. So here we get the and the addition of number of particles in the one one particle addition of one particle in the Fox state uh, in the n plus one and there is a under root n and i plus one it's a pro pro proportionality proportionality constant. Um, uh, so uh, like if we want to see it in a, another form, we can also look and write like this. Uh, so like uh, in a Fox space of, of N states, if we operate it uh, with a creation operator, there will be N plus one states now. So the opposite of this is the annihilation operator, which uh, will be denoted by AUI. And when it acts on this Fox state, we'll get uh, one lesser particle in the states with the under root NI constant. Uh, if you want to go in further details, you can, was this uh, video I have put it put here a link you can access to this video and uh, the the guy tells us uh, tells us about the fox space and uh, creation and annihilation operating details and for bosons and fermions as I told you earlier they follow commutation and anti-commutation relations therefore uh, we get this uh, 
AI, AI, AI AJ, uh, and they follow the commutation relation, we get these values uh, because of their because of the consequence of their commutation and symmetric uh, bosonic states. And uh, in fermions, we get this because of their anti-symmetric uh, fermionic states. And we show fermionic states in the uh, double bracket in this double bracket. I don't know what they call it, curly brackets, yeah. So move from this topic to neutron matter interactions. Uh, as Jennifer also told you about this, uh, I, will, I will tell you a little bit of details about this. Uh, as the neutrons, we know it's uh, uh, neutral particles. So they can penetrate uh, into the material up to one centimeter length and uh, they can scatter from the nucleus without even, uh, in, without even interfering with the electrons. But X-rays, they, they can only penetrate up to 10 to the power minus four to 10 to the power minus seven meter of the material. That's why they can only go through the electron cloud of the, of the atom. But electrons, they, they cannot go uh, like uh, more than one or two layers of the material. So that's why like uh, in, in TEM, uh, transmission electron microscopy or SEM, we get, we, we only see the surface of the particles, not inside of it. And uh, neutrons also interact uh, with the unpaired electrons via a magnetic dipole interaction. And so here we also have a magnetism. We can, uh, have, we can study the magnetism in, with the neutrons as well. So uh, neutrons has a very interesting energy scale, which, will, which I will tell you in the next slide. Here, uh, the neutrons has both particle-like and wave-like pro properties. That's why neutrons are magical. Uh, I will show you why they are magical. Uh, and, and the mass, uh, and there are some basic properties of neutrons, as you can see here. And the charge is neutral, the spin is half. And uh, lifetime of this uh, is 880 seconds, 88 seconds plus minus two, which means it is uh, it, it lives quite long than X-rays and electrons. And uh, we have other values like Planck constant here, and wave vector. Wave vector uh, is uh, equal to two pi by lambda. Wave vector is actually a difference in the momentum, and, uh, and which is equals to two pi by lambda or we can also write like this. And kinetic energy is half mv square, which is also equal to kVt. kV is the Boltzmann constant here. And we can also calculate the thermal neutron velocity and wavelength uh, with these different formulas here. And uh, uh, suppose like uh, uh, the neutrons, if the neutrons reach the thermal equilibrium by, by multiple collisions in a substance at room temperature, uh, the, the energy of this, uh, and the, this neutrons will be similar to the KBT, uh, which is also uh, very similar, very uh, close to the energy of the excitation of atoms in the, or separation of atoms in a, uh, in a condensed matter. Therefore, uh, uh, like the, the energy is so similar, uh, that's why, uh, Brockhaus, B. N. Uh, Brockhaus, he's a physics Nobel laureate uh, who got the Nobel Prize in 1994 for his neutron studies. Uh, he said that if the neutrons did not exist, it would need to be in invented. I mean, it's it's so important in the in the studies of uh, soft condensed matter uh, because of this uh, magical energy, uh, which is 26 milli electron volt. Uh, it is so close to the uh, separation of atoms in a condensed matter. That's why it is uh, very much useful for us. In this table, you can see, uh, as you, you did all should see that in the, in the Jennifer presentation. Uh, when we go from cold to hot, uh, the energy uh, is increasing and the wavelength is decreasing for obvious reasons. Uh, for, uh, but I, I will I will tell you about some, some more details about this. In the cold uh, in the cold neutrons, we use moderators as a uh, hydrogen or li liquid hydrogen or liquid deuterium at twenty kelvin, and for thermal we use H two O D two O at room temperature, and for hot neutron sources 
we use uh, moderators as a uh, graphite blocks at 2000 Kelvin. So there, um, that's how we get the different wavelengths and different energy of the neutrons and uh, we use in different uh, instruments. In the, in the conservation of momentum and energy, which I told you earlier as well, uh, and uh, Jennifer has shown you uh, the, the nice slides and, uh, and with, this, with the dog and playing the pool. So here you can see uh, and the one particle with the mass m and velocity v1. Uh, when it's collide to the other particle and with the mass m2 and velocity zero, uh, it will uh, it will affect the m2 particle and this will go to the different direction with a with a, with some velocity and the velocity of this uh, this m1 particle will also change. So after the collision we will have this uh, a different momentum, P1 dash and P2 dash for both the particles. And before the collision, we had the different momentum for both the particles, P1 and P2. And, uh, and uh, from the conservation of momentum, when we calculate the sum of the P1 and P2 and P1 dash and P2 dash, uh, they, are, they are similar. Th that's why we know is it follows the conservation of momentum and uh, also the conservation of energy uh, and that's how we also explain the elastic and inelastic scattering. Uh, for elastic scattering, they follow the conservation momentum, but uh, not the conservation of uh, uh, in, el in elastic scattering. They follow both the rules: uh, conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. But uh, for uh, for the inelastic scattering or quasi-elastic scattering, uh, they follow the conservation of momentum, but not the conservation of energy. Uh, for the inelastic sketch, uh, for the elastic scattering, uh, there is an introduction of neutron, uh, interaction of neutron with the nuclei, and uh, there can be an exchange of energy and momentum, uh, but uh, but the transfer of energy will be zero. And uh, uh, here, when the when the neutron collide with the with the nuclei here, uh, it will scatter like this uh, with a different uh, momentum and different energy. So the uh, in elastic scattering, uh, Ki the Ki value will be similar to the Kf, which is equals to two pi by lambda, and uh, the scattering vector will equal will be equal to two k sine theta, which is equals to four pi by lambda sine theta, and the energy transfer, as I told you, uh, it will be zero uh, at h cross omega. Uh, for example, of uh, elastic scattering, I sh have shown here is the sounds. Uh, it, for, it, it works on the principle of uh, elastic scattering. Uh, this is a D11 inst instrument in ILL for particular. Uh, the, the characteristics of D11 instrument is uh, uh, actually we use it in condensed matter physics, con condensed matter particles mostly, or soft matter particles. Uh, uh, in, in this, uh, we, can, we, we can see that uh, the incident wavelength is uh, uh, 4.5 to 40 angstrom, which we have seen uh, in the table that uh, it, this, is, this lies in the cold neutron, cold neutron region, which means we use cold neutrons in the D11 instrument. And the neutron flux is 1 to 10 to the power 8 neutrons per centimeter square per second. And the detector we had uh, it's a 96 into 96 centimeters square, three helium gas detector, which we just changed uh, in, in, the, in this cycle. So we are using this new detector, uh, which I will show you in the next slide. And the typical sample size we have is the 10 to 10 millimeters square, and the, we have low background because it, this instrument is very far away from the, from the neutron source. And uh, they, they are 40 meter collimeters, so the sample will be around 140 meters away from the neutron source. That's why we have low background environment here. And uh, there are a lot of applications for this uh, in this instrument. We, we can measure polym polymers, collides, and just so many things. And uh, uh, we also have, we can also have different extreme environments like low temperature and uh, magnetism and so on. And uh, yeah, it's the D detector in D11. It was the uh, old detector, which you can see it's a round detector, um, but uh, the detector is this one, not the, not the round one. 
So it's a, a square one with a 96 into 96 centimeter square. But the, this is a new detector. It's a rectangular detector we have. And uh, in this detector, we, we are using uh, a different uh, 192 tubes in this detector, but this is uh, uncorrodable, uncorrodable uh, stainless steel, uh, which, which had three helium gas filled in it. And we, we, all, we will also have here uh, two small detectors here and here. Uh, which will also have 32 and 32 tubes. Uh, so now we will have a larger surface area and we will have better count rate now. It's so similar to D22, I think, uh, the detector, but it's, it's good we had this one now. And in elastic scattering, in, in this also, in the, we measure the interaction of uh, neutron with nuclei and uh, there can be exchange of energy and momentum, but here the energy transfer will not be zero. So the, so we have here is the energy delta, delta E will be is equal to H cross omega, which is not zero here. And we will have the subtraction of incident and in the final energy here. And uh, actually it, it is very useful in, uh, uh, in, the, in this neutron field like uh, this, uh, inelastic scattering, uh, we can measure the molecular and uh, atomic vibrations, uh, which is very useful for the, for the, whole, for the whole picture of the, the structure information of the particles of the materials. And in inelastic scattering, uh, neutrons create and annihilate uh, an excitation state inside the sample because uh, uh, we like in, in elastic scattering, we do not measure energy, but in, in elastic scattering, we measure the energy. So we, we find here is uh, they create and late an excitation state inside the sample. But, but one, one must keep track not only of the flight direction, but also the energy of the scattered neutrons. So there are, uh, there are major instruments on ela in elastic scattering, a three, three which we have in ILL. So triple axis spectrometer, time of flight spectrometer, and neutron spin echo. Uh, I showed you here, it's a, a time of flight spectrometer, which is IN6 in ILL. It's also called SHARP now. Uh, so in this uh, time of flight, we measure the velocity. Uh, we measure the uh, change in velocity of neutrons uh, before and after the collision uh, with the sample. So here, the instruments we are using here in ILL, uh, which is related to inelastic scattering, there, there are triple axes, uh, which are IN12, TALS, IN3, IN20, IN22, and so on. And they, they are different because uh, we are using different kind of uh, uh, neutrons. Like in, in these two, we are using cold sources. In this, we are using thermal. And IN, in IN1, we are using hot neutron source. So it all different uh, depending on their neutron energy and, uh, and their intensity and their flux. So yeah, they are all different. Uh, unless they, are, they, are, they, depend, they work on the same principle, but they are different. Uh, in this uh, high resolution backscattering, we have this IN13 and IN16B and this uh, TOF, uh, we have uh, this sharp and uh, panther and the uh, chopper spectrometer. Chopper spectrometer is actually an uh, instrument uh, with the TOF, uh, I mean, with the time of flight. It's, it works similarly with the time, like time of flight. But the main difference is the, the monochromators, how we use it. Uh, we use uh, choppers here in, uh, in chopper spectrometer, but in uh, TUF, uh, we use crystals and uh, then Fermi chopper, I think. In neutron spin echo, we measure the spin, uh, spin excitations of the samples. And uh, we have this IN15 and WASP. And here is the in interesting fact about WASP. It's a wide angle spectrometer uh, that uh, WASP is a replacement of IN11. 
and iron 11 was uh, the same instrument but uh, here in was but we changed this uh, we changed the fundamental of the uh, this magnetic layout so now we have a higher data rate and uh, with the same resolution or uh, the, the the data rate is uh, 50 times higher than the previous one Uh, there's a difference between elastic and elastic scattering. As you can see here, uh, as I told you, uh, elastic scattering, they scattered uh, uh, like this when the incident direction, incident neutron comes and uh, it scatters like this. And uh, there will be K and K, K dash uh, moment, uh, wave vector. And then from Q, we can calculate the difference with, within it. And uh, in elastic scattering, uh, there are two types of scattering actually. And uh, when neutron loses its energy and when neutron gains its energy. And uh, it depends on the temperature. At low temperature, when the nuclei move slowly uh, and when neutrons collide with it uh, or scatter through it, scatter with it, uh, it loses its energy. But at high temperature, when the nuclei moves faster in the material, uh, then neutrons comes to the sample and uh, gains energy. And uh, from this, we can get the Q. Uh, Q is a momentum, uh, moment of uh, wave vector, scat the scattering wave vector. And uh, we can also get the omega, which is the energy transfer, uh, which tells us about the dynamics and Q tells us about the structure. And uh, we measure the uh, SQW, SQ omega from this scatter neutrons. Uh, but like uh, um, from this SQ omega, we, we can have the full image of the materials, like uh, the much we can get out from it. Uh, we have everything, we have every information of the materials uh, from this, if we have the both of, both of the values. Uh, so here, uh, it's a Cauchy, it's, it's a uh, diagram with the energy transfer and neutron counts. Uh, and you can see here, Cauchy elastic scattering as well. Uh, uh, Cauchy elastic scattering is actually a mixture of elastic and inelastic, uh, where energy transfer is uh, near to zero, but not zero. So that, therefore, it, it does not follow the conservation of energy. Uh, and here in elastic scattering, uh, you can see the count rate is very high. That's why we do not have better resolution. Uh, as you, uh, like, uh, if if you want a better resolution, there will be smaller the resolution volume and the lower the count rate. That's that's why we we have this uh, better resolution in cos elastic and inelastic scattering. And as I told you in the previous slide, uh, when the neutrons loses its energy. It shows the anti-Stokes, uh, anti-Stokes lines, and uh, when the neutrons gains energy, gains energy, it shows the Stokes line. And uh, from the elastic scattering, uh, like in a real world, the, the the energy transfer is not zero. It's a should be, it should be a delta function. Uh, but uh, but yeah, we we consider it as a zero. Uh, and in elastic scattering, there is an energy exchange H omega cross, which is not equal to zero. And it tells us about the uh, vibration modes and the stretching modes in, in, this, in the material. And uh, from the cos elastic scattering, we can learn the diffusion uh, coefficients and rotation and molecular vibrations uh, or, or translations from cos elastic. And, uh, but why do we care about cos elastic scattering? I mean, like uh, uh, in, uh, in they ha they have so many applications in different kind of fields. Like in material science, we can we can study hydrogen storage and the surface science and fuel cells, and in soft matter, in biology, in chemistry, they have so many applications. And uh, uh, as a probe, uh, we determine the diffusion coefficients at at a molecular scale. So. Uh, we can differentiate diffusion from confined dynamics, and uh, uh, we can uh, we can determine the time and spatial scale, which are directly comparable to the results from MD simulations, molecular dynamics simulations, 
and uh, and this is also complementary with the other experimental techniques. And uh, for the diffusion coefficients, we also do DLS, dynamic light scattering, which also use cross elastic scattering, but in light scattering. So uh, like uh, it's a complementary to the cross elastic neutron scattering. Uh, and we also use uh, static light scattering, but which fall, which is a complementary to, to the SANS technique. Uh, here we can, what can we see with the cross elastic or inelastic scattering? Uh, uh, it, there is a table here you can see uh, when we increasing the energy and uh, we, uh, we, can, we can study different fields or different types of uh, different types of atoms or different studies we can we can see here in magnetic and nuclear scattering uh, like uh, from 0 0.1 to 1 milli electron volt we can see the diffusion we can study the diffusion of particles and uh, in magnetic scattering we can study the spin fluctuations and uh, from 1 to 80 milli electron volt uh, we can study the phonons uh, uh, phonons scattering and uh, the vibrations in the lattice and uh, in the magnetic in the magnetic scattering we can learn the magnon magnons which is analogous to phonons so yeah it, it depends on energy energy what we, what energy we are using so the coherent and incoherent neutron scattering i think uh, in the next uh, upcoming presentation they will tell you about these in details but uh, coherent scattering is actually uh, where we have uh, uh, where we have uh, uh, where we have uh, uh, isotopic uh, isotopic scattering uh, scattering length, and uh, uh, where we have uh, um, uh, neutral. One second. Uh, in coherent scattering, uh, actually the neutron spin uh, is a zero. Uh, if we want a pure coherent scattering, for example, in helium, for example, in, uh, in oxygen and carbon, we can have purely coherent scattering. But in incoherent scattering, uh, we can have a, a, like variation in the neutron spin and uh, we will have different uh, Isotopes. If we have different isotopes present in the sample, or if we have a, a different scattering lengths of the of the atoms in, in the sample, then we have incoherent scattering. But uh, in SANS, uh, in small angle neutron scattering, uh, incoherent scattering is uh, featureless. They give us uh, nothing but the featureless spectra, which we, which we don't even use it. But incoherent scattering is very useful in. Uh, uh, in the giving the information on single particle dynamics. But the coherent scattering is useful for the structure information. Uh, in elastic coherent scattering, we can see like where are the atoms, what is the shape of the objects, and we can see the structure shape uh, of, the of the particles. In, uh, and in inelastic coherent scattering, we can see the excitation spectrum in crystals, for example, in phonons and magnons. In quasi elastic, we can we can learn the correlative diffuser motions. For the in, for the elastic incoherent scattering, we can we can study the Debye Waller factor, which gives us the thermal motions of uh, molecular vibrations and uh, and uh, this elastic incoherent structure factor and so on. And in inelastic uh, incoherent scattering, we can get the molecular vibrations and quasi elastic we can get the diffusive dynamics and diffusive coefficients. And there's a difference between elastic and quasi-elastic in elastic scattering. Uh, as I told you, uh, the, there will be no energy transfer in elastic scattering, but uh, there will be near to nearly no energy, but uh, like in the range of nano-electron volt or micro-electron volt energy transfer in quasi-elastic. And uh, there will be some energy transfer in inelastic scattering. And uh, momentum transfer will not be zero, but uh, they, will, uh, they will follow the principle of conservation of momentum. And elastic scattering gives us the structural information and the cost elastic and inelastic scattering, they gives us the relative and self motion. 
and uh, they do not analyze the energy of the scattered neutrons, uh, as I told you, but uh, in Cauchy and inelastic scattering, the annihilation of energy is very important. And uh, for elastic, we use uh, uh, sans, we use reflectometry, diffraction instruments, and so on. And quasi and inelastic scattering, we use neutron spinnaco, co coherent scattering, and, and time of flight and backscattering instruments. And in this. Uh, uh, Mohit, Mohit, excuse me. Um, how many slides do you have remaining approximately? Just um, two more. Okay, I was just. Uh, uh, in elastic and inelastic scattering, uh, there is a graph, as you can see here. Uh, it's, a, it's a wave vector with its energy transfer, Q and, a, Q and E. And you can see here, it's a, this is the uh, elastic scattering region uh, where, you can, uh, where you can study these type of materials, uh, these type of studies uh, in this region. And uh, uh, as you can see, uh, ILL without spinnacle, we, can, we could have measured this, this particles uh, without spinaco, but now we have spinaco, so we can uh, increase the ener in decrease energy range and uh, also enlarge the Q region here in, in, uh, with, with the help of spinaco. And the last slide is uh, introduction of phonons. I'm, I'm not going into details. I think it will be a, a, a they will tell you about this in later in the upcoming, in upcoming presentations. But uh, phonons are actually this uh, is the quanta of energy in a in a rigid lattice. Uh, where when there is a suppose it's a crystal, it's a rigid crystal lattice where we can if we can displace one of the atom here, uh, they will they will vibrate. They will uh, they will vibrate until they come to the equilibrium position again. So this due to these vibrations. Uh, the lattice can be considered as a harmonic oscillators. Uh, and uh, from the quantum mechanics, we know that harmonic oscillators is quantized. So this quanta of energy is called a phonon. And this frequency of phonon depends on the wavelength of distortion and the masses of these atoms and the stiffness of the springs and that connect them. And in conclusion, uh, uh, which, which I said earlier, uh, creation and annihilation operator allow us to navigate the Fox space and uh, where we can change the number of particles and inelastic scattering does not change its energy, but the total kinetic energy before and after the collision remains the same. And uh, in, we, can, we can investigate the structure using elastic scattering and uh, dynamics using inelastic and quasi-elastic scattering. And quasi-elastic and neutron spinaco spectroscopy are used to measure slow electrician dynamics and such as center of mass diffusion and molecular orientation. And thanks to Jennifer and Helmut and Ralph for helping me in the slides and thank you all for, for your attention.